yeah, I brought some for me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, please do. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I'm re I'm really sorry to interrupt. Um, can I encourage you to find a seat if you can, please? May the people's praise. And a really, really warm welcome. I'm so great to see you. Lovely to see lots of familiar faces and other faces I don't know. Um, it's a real joy to have you gathered here tonight from different churches. Um, I'm just delighted that you could join us for this evening. Tonight we're going to consider how we can engage uh, this city, the world, with the good news of Jesus Christ. We're going to hear uh, from lots of different people and uh, how they are doing that and how we can be involved in that. Um, can I just say that if you're here and you're not a committed follower of Jesus, it's lovely to have you here, delighted you're with us. Hopefully you'll pick up some of our joy and love for the news that we want to share with the world, that we think that Jesus is the best news in the world. So um, I hope you enjoy this evening and get a sense of that as we go through. God's heart for our world is that people from all nations come to know the love of Jesus Christ and come to praise the God we were made for. Just listen to this promise uh, made about Jesus, about God's King, right back in uh, Psalm 72. All nations will be blessed through him, and they will call him blessed, Praise be to the Lord God, the God of Israel, who alone does marvelous deeds. Praise be to his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Well, we're going to begin by singing some of those truths, singing praise to this God, this Savior, with the words of our first song, May the Peoples Praise You. So musicians are going to lead us. Would you stand and let's sing together? glorious light that we may sing the wonders of the risen Christ may our every breath retell the grace that broke into our strife with boundless love and deepest joy the people's praise you. Let the nations be glad. All your blessing comes that we may praise, may praise the name of Jesus. For the 
earth is yours and all with me. Each harvest is your own. And from your hand we give to you to make Christ known. May the seeds of mercy grow in us for those who have not songs of praise build lives of grace to spread your may the peoples praise you let the nations be glad all your blessing comes that we may praise may praise the name of Jesus This a holy privilege to declare your praises, your name, to every nation, tribe, and tongue, your church proclaims. May the peoples praise you, let the nations be Dublin. It's a city full of beauty and culture. It's a city full of character and life. In the summer it fills with tourists all wanting to get a taste of its heritage. It's a city that prides itself on innovation and progress. But you don't need to look too far beneath the surface to see it's a city of brokenness, a city searching for hope, a city in need of Christ. Since the 1640s, there have been Baptist churches in Dublin. And right now in the city, there are seven Baptist churches proclaiming Christ. Is there really a need for more churches? To effectively reach the city with the gospel, one church per 10,000 people is needed. Dublin has a population of 1.4 million. So just looking at the numbers, it's clear lots still needs to be done. But what about on the ground? This is Rathmines. It's the end of the suburbs before the city centre begins and there's a mix of longer term residents and more short term transient groups like students, young professionals, foreign nationals living in apartments and bed sits. Uh, if it wasn't so early in the morning here, you'd see the energy and the hustle and bustle even during COVID times. And there are so many who need the good news of Jesus. The challenge for us as a church is how to reach out to those longer term residents and those shorter term visitors with that good news. Here in Black Rock, South County, Dublin, 
Uh, we're in the heartland of well-established, settled Irish affluence. RTE Studios and University College Dublin are just to the north of us here. And then the historic and popular Dunleary Harbour is just to the south, beyond that upmarket Kalini and Dawkey. We've perceived a couple of things. The first thing is that there's a quiet hostility towards Christianity and the church. The church is perceived as scandal embroiled and no longer relevant to life in modern Ireland. But at the same time, we've perceived a deep yearning among people, a, a longing for something, for, for new life. Self-sufficiency, as we know, often plays itself out. So there's real need here in Black Rock for the biblical gospel to be explained and for local communities of Christians to quietly and confidently live out and share the gospel to people who sometimes haven't even realized their spiritual poverty. Life in Dublin, north of the city, I suppose is like life in any other big city. Bustling, busy people just trying to get by and get on with their lives without any real thought of eternity. We live in a population of 100,000 people within a one mile radius of our church building. We're the only evangelical church in the area. And that scenario is repeated many times across the north side of the city. The population just keeps on growing. And we need to keep pace with that, with our church planting. Well, hello everybody. My name is Philomena and I am from Ballycullen Community Church and it is my absolute joy and privilege to be able to teach the Bible as the youth worker to children, to teenagers and to even young adults. I'm going to invite up onto the stage a good friend of mine, Anne Higgins, who is also a member of Ballycullen Community Church and she's going to share with us how God has been using Ballycullen Community Church uh, to um, point her to Christ when, when she didn't know Christ. Hello, Anne. How are you doing? Hi, how are you? I'm good. I'm just going to rob my glittery notebook off you there. <laughs> so funny. Thanks for doing the interview today. You're welcome. <laughs> so how did you first come in contact with Ballycullen Community Church? Um, my daughter, Carol, came to faith and noticed a lot, quite a change in her and... I just wanted to get and find out for myself what caused this change. And Carol invited me, you can come anytime you want, ma'am. Come anytime you want. So I took her up on the opportunity to go to Valley Cullen. That's great. So you saw your daughter who had come to faith in Christ and you saw the change mm. that knowing Jesus brings and that sparked an interest in you. Yeah. And you want to say, hey, who are these guys at Valley Cullen? What are they doing? Yeah. Um, so what were you expecting when you came through the doors for the first time at Ballycullen Community Church? I'm not really sure, to be honest. It was just I wanted to see what had caused the change in Carol. And just, it was just a curiosity to know who these people were and why they caused this, this good change in Carol, in my daughter. But it was just it was a curiosity. And probably, as a mother, a bit of a, hmm, who are these people? <laughs> yeah, every mother's like, hmm, yeah. <laughs> are these people that my daughter are involved with? Okay, so you had some assumptions about, about Ballycullen as a church and also about Christianity. Um, and when you came for the first time to Ballycullen, what, what was your experience? What did you notice? Oh, the first thing was the gospel was being explained. And as a Catholic all my life, going to Mass, and just, it was just always something missing. And I went to Bally Cullen and I said, this is what has been missing in my life. The explanation of the gospel, the preaching of God's word. And I just came away and I was, never looked at my watch once the whole time I was there. Whereas normally in mass, you're looking at your watch all the time. <laughs> so um, I just came away and I was, oh my gosh, that was amazing. That was, that was my response. Wow, so you're like, this is the yeah. first time yeah. I've heard the Bible being clearly taught. Yeah. 
and you were amazed. So I'm curious to know, well, I already know, but maybe people here are curious to know, what happened next? Did you instantly, regularly come to church, get involved in the studies, or, or how did that happen no, in your life? it was a slow kind of thing. I started going to Ballycullen maybe every few weeks. Not regularly, Every might be every four weeks, could be every six weeks, but I found myself going to, after maybe six months, Ballycullen Church was where I went every Sunday. Every Sunday is where um, I stopped going to Mass. I just was going to Ballycullen and started doing uh, the Christianity Explorer with Jeff and Caroline. Brilliant. So Jeff is the pastor of Ballycullen yeah. Community Church. His wife Caroline's here tonight. It's great to see you, Caroline. Um, and after doing some of those studies, um, did you find then that the rest of your family were asking questions because God had been working in your daughter's life and now in your life? My, what was your family's response to this? My children, like my children are all grown up. My children noticed quite a difference in me and they didn't explain what it was. I couldn't explain what it was. It was just the joy of knowing the Lord. It's the only way I can explain it. That's how I felt. I was still feel. That's great. Can we give Anne Higgins a round of applause just for wanting to share? Like... How encouraging is it to hear of how God is using local churches, uh, not only in Anne's daughter's life, but in her life, and now it's extending into the rest of her family, and her husband, Jerry, has been doing many different Bible studies with her church family. Uh, but actually, there was no local church in the Ballycullen area in 2004, and the former pastor of Grosvenor Road Baptist, John Samuel, is going to share now in this video of how the gospel has impacted this area of Dublin. Great. So this evening so far, we've heard about the impact having a local church has on people's lives in giving them a chance to hear about Jesus and respond to the gospel. I have John here with me so we can hear a bit about the background of that local church being planted. So thank you, John, for being with us this evening. It's a delight to be with you all. Hello, everybody, and I count it a real privilege and honour to join you tonight. Great. Yes, and you're joining us from London today, um, mm -hmm. but as many here this evening uh, know, you pastored the church here in Grosvenor for many years. Um, so we'd love to hear from you about how you and the church leadership in Grosvenor came to have the desire to be a church that plants churches. So can you tell us a bit about how that vision came about and why you saw Dublin as a place that needed more evangelical churches? Thanks, Kim. Well, it's a great question. When we arrived in 1993, um, we realized that evangelical churches in Dublin were fairly thin on the ground, certainly compared with where I was from in the south of England. Um, so um, there were maybe 20 or 30 churches uh, in the Dublin area, which might be called evangelical. There were four Baptist churches in fellowship with the, the Baptist, uh, what's well, the Baptist Association now. Um, and that I, I realized after a little while of thinking that that was equivalent to a six ABCI churches in the whole of Northern Ireland. Um, and that, that was quite a shocking statistic for me. Um, and then in, um, in 1996, in September 1996, uh, the Southern Association of the uh, of the Baptists in Ireland invited a guy called Johann Lucasse. I may have mispronounced his name, but he was a Belgian church planter, uh, and he shared a, an experience about a church in the centre of Brussels, which had thought it would be too damaging for it to plant out. Uh, and so it resisted. And then the Lord changed their minds. And over the years, they planted out two churches. And I remember that was, be, that was used by the Lord as a real challenge to me, which I then took back to the eldership and the membership. Um, that that was a, an equivalent situation, you know, the capital city uh, of a country which was predominantly Catholic um, and a church, an evangelical church in the center, which was long established, but was, was nervous about um, weakening itself by church planting. Uh, then the next year, God brought along Sean Mullen for a visit. Uh, we invited him to address us on the issue of church planting in Grosvenor. He was working for Baptist Missions at the time down in Middleton. He came in 97 and he challenged us on two fronts. One was to pray 
And the other was to think about not merely being a, about planting a church, but becoming a church planting church. Um, and I think looking back, I am so thrilled at what's happened with BlackRock in the last few years with the McConnells, who I know well. Um, and um, Mandy was a teenager in Grosvenor when I first arrived. Um, and um, it's just fabulous to see Ballycullen and then BlackRock planted out. And, and a, a wonderful reflection of that original challenge from Brussels about a city centre church planted out twice. Yeah, that's great. So you saw that there was um, opportunity in the church. Um, mm -hmm. How did the first church plant to Ballycullen unfold? And can you tell us a bit about um, how you involved Baptist missions in that process as well? Well, we couldn't have done it without Baptist missions. And I, I really want to pay tribute to the wonderful support and partnership in the gospel that was provided by Baptist missions in those early days. Um, and especially to Derek Baxter and Philip Brown, um, of um, great memory. Uh, we, we are, I personally am so thankful to them for their support um, and for their underwriting the whole project. And one of the things that I shall never forget is although we we'd agreed that we'd do a joint venture, it was really underwritten by Baptist Missions and they never queried um, the financial side of things. They were just there for us, not, not just with a pat on the back, but with money in the bank. Uh, and I think that that is a great tribute to their vision and commitment to church planting. Yeah, that's great. So um, can you tell us a little bit? So you had the, the vision um, to go, I guess, um, but it did come to that day in January 2004 um, that the core group left uh, for Ballycullen, um, a day that you'd all been working towards. Um, what was it like in the following weeks at Grosvenor? I said to my wife, the following Sunday, I think when we got home after church, honey, I shrank the church. <laughs> uh, you know, it was just, it was a wonderful day the previous Sunday. As we had, I don't know if you've got the picture up there or had it tonight uh, of the group that stood on the platform at the front of Grosvenor, about 60, including children. Mm -hmm. And we prayed for them, we commissioned them, and off they went. It was a wonderful um high day in the life of the church the next sunday was so discouraging at one level in terms of massive holes in the in the pews and in the numbers mm. but one of the things that i sh again i shall never forget in the lord's goodness a year later we were as full as we had been the mm. sunday we sent mm. them off that was a great lesson for me yeah, that's incredible to, to hear how God just, um, yeah, filled the church again, filled those gaps, um, really just his faithfulness in honouring, I guess, uh, your commitment to serving him and reaching out into different parts of Dublin. So that's really encouraging to hear. Um, you're now serving the Lord in London. Um, but as you look back, um, and you've already slightly mentioned already, but as you look back uh, to Dublin, what are what are you encouraged by as you see what's been going on in Ballycullen, um, as it's been planted a, a number of years now, um, and also at Grosvenor, or maybe even the the wider vision for church planting in Dublin? Yeah, um, well, I've got it. I haven't have it in front of me. I've printed off the Ballycullen project proposal for Baptist Missions Ireland. What was it dated? Um, January 1999. Wow. That's when we first put the proposal. Um, and that right at the end, there was a kind of model, um, there was a possible time frame uh, with years one to two, three to five, six to ten. Um, it took longer than that. Um, God's timetable is nearly always a bit stretched out beyond ours. Um, mm. And the, the last one is the church planted to be replaced. This is year six to 10, a church planted to be replaced by a pastor teacher and the church moves towards being a self-supporting, self-governing, self-reproducing church. This was about Valley Cullen. Um, and I shall never forget, some years after we'd left and I'd come to London and I was back for the Irish Preachers Conference and I went to visit um, Jeff Hay, pastor of Valley Cullen. And I, I was inquiring, I, it was a bit of a, rude question really i said how the finances of the church and he said well just this last year we've reached the point of self-sufficiency and we no longer rely on outside help and i thought 
praise the Lord. That that is just that's the final piece of the jigsaw as far as the church planting out of Grover at Ballycannon was. Mm. Uh, the Lord has blessed the work. I mean, there were difficult times in the early days. Talk to Craig Maiden. Um, there were some real challenges, um, personalities, mm. styles of leadership, mm. um, immensely painful stuff that I can recall. I won't go into any detail whatsoever, um, but it was very painful mm. uh, dealing with some of the personalities. But we persevered, and, and particularly Craig persevered, Craig and Heather, um, and did a fantastic job. Uh, and the Lord has blessed the work, and we're so thankful to him. Yeah, that's great. Well, thank you so much for joining us this evening and just sharing us a little bit of, of that journey that you um, and Ola Grovner went through. Um, it's just incredible to see how he worked through you guys. Um, so thank you so much for joining us this evening and we'll, we'll talk to you again, no doubt. <laughs> well, love to you all and all the very best and keep up the good work. And thanks for having me. Thanks, Kim. Bye bye. in his hands who has numbered every grain of sand kings and nations tremble at his voice all creation rises to rejoice behold our God seated on his throne come let
Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Richard McConnell, and I serve as the church planter and pastor at Black Rock Community Church. And it's a great privilege to be here tonight with you. And hasn't it been exciting so far just to hear and see and remember what the Lord has been doing in Dublin? And in a few moments, we're going to turn to God's word, and we're going to ask him uh, for his help to understand what his word says, and also the challenge for each one of us as we think about not just the chapter gone by, but the next chapters in church planting here in Dublin. Well, why don't uh, we pray together and ask for God's help as we turn to his word. Let's pray. Father, we ask that through your word you would speak to us. We pray that the message that I would deliver would be your words, your voice, your challenge to each one of us. Father, thank you again for this opportunity. And we pray that we would be responsive to your living word. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, please turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 18. And I'm going to read the first 17 verses for us. There should be a Bible there in front, or if not, you can turn on your device. This is Acts and chapter 18. This is God's word. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them. Because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. But when the Jews opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am clear of my responsibility. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue ruler, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard him believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him into court. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to the Jews, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanor or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he had them ejected from the court. Then they all turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue ruler, and beat him in front of the court. But Gallio showed no concern whatever. This is God's word. Now, you could say it's quite hard to read Acts, in spite of these fascinating accounts that we've just read. We, of course, live in a very different Dublin, don't we? A very different Europe, in fact. Our world is 2,000 years, more than that even, apart from the Europe of Acts described here. There's no longer a Roman Empire, and some of the cities described here on these pages aren't served by Ryanair flights. And so this, is a, this account, Acts, it's hard to relate to. But that's not it. The reason you and I find it so hard to read Acts is because of something else. It's because of our tendency, 
even if we're committed Christians, it's our tendency to be on a very different wavelength than Luke, who wrote this. To put it another way, we read Acts from a very different vantage point. We've all benefited from Europe, haven't we? Our material prosperity, our values, our culture. And I think it's true that most of us are often, day to day anyway, more interested in the rising cost of living, the housing crisis, COVID rates of infection, the politics of vaccination. We all love Dublin. We love Europe. And so you and I may be so distracted by the city around us, so overwhelmed by the powerful forces of finance and multinational players and social upheaval after social upheaval, that you and I could doubt the power of the gospel to make inroads here in Dublin in the 21st century, just as it did back in the first. And now you can see, can't you? You see, Luke's focus is totally different. His attention is on the gospel's relentless drive into hostile territory, like this European city of Corinth. Well, here's what's going to happen as we read it. Acts, God's word, refocuses us, you and me. Helps us to see what happens when that unstoppable gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, confronts all those distractions, all the resistance to the gospel, all the power brokers of even the most worldly and broken cities, Dublin. Look at the vignettes. People like Aquila, Priscilla, and then those longer descriptions of, of the work of key players like Paul. And see the power and unstoppable drive forward at the front lines of gospel proclamation in Europe. And as we look here for just a few moments at Acts 18, I'd like us to pause and take note of at least, and here's where we're going, take note of at least four critical elements of church planting work in the cities. Four critical elements of church planting work in the cities. Now, you're also going to hear something very deliberate, too, a plea, a plea for your continued and your renewed partnership as we continue to work in this city of Dublin for Christ, as, if, as we continue to work in Europe and the world for Christ. Okay, so four critical elements of church planting work in the cities. Well, here's number one here in Acts chapter 18. Take note of the priority of preaching in planting new churches. That's the first thing, the priority of preaching in planting new churches. So Paul left Athens, we know that from verse 1 here, and he went to Corinth. Now Corinth is the fifth European city, and there were no Ryanair flights. It's the fifth city on his tour here since God directed him into Europe. And if you look back in the chapter, start of chapter 16, you'll see that move into Europe. And as Paul establishes himself here in Corinth, look what he does. Verse 4, every Sabbath, every Sabbath, he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. So what does Paul do? He reasoned. He was trying to persuade. And eventually, look at verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. Preaching, testifying, Jesus is the Christ. Now the rest of this chapter continues that emphasis. If you haven't already picked it up with those couple of words, preaching, testifying, look at verse 9, speaking, teaching the word of God, verse 11, persuading, verse 13. That's the stuff that Paul's doing. And so we can see this was the focus of that pioneering mission work, proclamation of the gospel, public preaching and teaching the word of God as a matter of absolute priority. And, and look at the arrival there of Silas and Timothy. You see, that seems to have enabled Paul to do it more and more, not just on the Sabbath, presumably. Perhaps Silas and Timothy brought some money with them from Macedonia, or maybe they were able to work and support Paul themselves. And even when opposition 
sparked confrontation at the synagogue, and Paul moved, quite matter-of-factly, to the house next door, verse 7. There, too, what does he do? Well, it's the preaching of Christ that Paul kept up with. Preaching that leads to that really encouraging report. Look at verse 8. Isn't that amazing? Crispus, the synagogue leader, verse 8, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. You see, the proclaimed gospel is powerful, isn't it? Powerful, powerful gospel. And Luke brings us to refocus on it time and time again. And it's perhaps too easy for us to assume that pioneering gospel work like this, like planting new churches, will always have that public proclamation as a priority. So you and I need to take note in church planting, the, pro- the proclamation, the preaching, the testifying of Christ, that's the priority. Early on in 2019, we were upstairs in Starbucks in Stillorgan. And the Starbucks had let us buy our coffees downstairs and go upstairs. And if you know Stillorgan, it's a, it's a lovely little building. And you, there's a lovely room upstairs. And they let us have our Bible study in the evenings during the week upstairs in that Starbucks. Now, one evening I was talking to the manager who told me that there'd been a few complaints about us from the week before. Because apparently... Some of the customers had complained that they had heard preaching. And boy, was that report right. (laughs) We were listening to a video series by none other than D.A. Carson. And I know that the volume on the TV we'd brought in was up too loud. But another part of me knew that sadly, it wasn't loud or public enough. You see, that's what we do, don't we, in church planting? On Sundays, on weekdays, in public, at the CU events, in discussions with interested people, with our friends and our neighbors, at the community carols, there must be pre proclamation. The powerful gospel, if it's ever to make inroads in our city, must be proclaimed boldly, courageously. And preaching, we have to note here, not just simply as one activity among many others of similar importance, No, no, I think you can see Luke's emphasis here as he reports what happens. It's preaching as the priority. So our churches, old and new, the ones that are still in our prayers for Dublin in the generations to come, must make proclamation a priority. And let me just say, yes, preaching for the building up of nourished, equipped communities of believers, absolutely, Yet at the same time, this must be proclamation that reasons and persuades outsiders to believe in Jesus Christ and then to be baptized in his name. I'm preaching not because it's our tradition and never for our entertainment, but because it's God's means of winning hostile people in hostile cities for Christ. So let's take note from God's word, the priority of preaching. And it's all through those other accounts too, in Europe and in those other places Paul went to. Reasoning, persuading, preaching, testifying, speaking, teaching the word of God. Now we're going to have to come back to this priority because maintaining that focus doesn't just depend on pastors and church planters. It really doesn't. But for now, I want you to see something else that emerges from these verses. You see, as well as that first thing, that priority of preaching, take note of, secondly, the crucial role of teamwork. Verses 1 to 8, and then from 18 to 22 specifically. The crucial role of teamwork. You see, the pattern of Paul's ministry in Corinth is similar to what he's been doing in all those other cities. He makes his way to the synagogue to preach, to reason and persuade with the Jews. But in Corinth, we also see the start of of strategic partnerships. Acts introduces us to lots of people who help Paul at various points in his his work. But here, and this is second, and, and you'll read this, second only to the description of the work in Ephesus, we're given a glimpse of quite a number of people who help in the church planting work. So not just Paul, but quite a list of other people. Look at verse two. Paul met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, 
who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Interesting, isn't it? So as the gospel takes root in cities, it's clear that church planting work needs supportive partnerships. Now, see that Paul gets established, and as he gets into life in Corinth, he stays and he works with this couple. Presumably, they had been Christians since their time in Rome. And Paul does the same work. Tent making, maybe leather working, whatever it is, he's working to pay his way. And he's supported by Aquila and Priscilla. And then, wonderfully, you have verse 5. You see, when Silas and Timothy came, here's two more, and they'd been working with Paul before. When they came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. So the team grows. It's amazing, isn't it? And with more support now, you've got Silas and you've got Timothy. And it's not just a bigger team that Luke wants us to see. But look at the kind of support that they offer. You see, it's the kind of support that enables proclamation ministry. You see, Paul can now devote himself exclusively to the preaching, supported as he is by Priscilla and Aquila, by Silas and Timothy. And then there's a few others in that team too, aren't there? You've got this guy, Titius Justus, the house owner. You've got Crispus, the synagogue leader. And then you've got poor Sosthenes down in verse 17. Teamwork is really crucial as the gospel takes hold in the city. Crucial so that preaching can be the priority. You see the link, don't you? Crucial teamwork so that the proclamation of the gospel can continue. Engaging with the city, it was strategic teamwork that allowed the gospel of Christ to take root. And Corinth, as you know, was a very hard place. Corinth was a byword for all kinds of things. And yet the gospel takes root as the Lord uses these teams. And supported by the co-workers, Paul could very boldly. And look what he does in verse 6. How could he have such boldness of verse 6? He could pronounce biblical judgment on the Jewish people who would not listen to the watchman Paul standing right in front of them. You might want to look up Ezekiel chapter 33 for that reference. Now think about engaging with our city, with Dublin. It'll require the same strategic teamwork. And that's something that the Lord may be laying on your heart and your mind this evening. You see, the people who make up church plants are much more than attendees. They're team members. And God's word is challenging us to move perhaps, and maybe this is you, maybe this is you watching in on the live stream, to move from simple church involvement into the realm of team member commitment. And there's all the difference in the world between those two things. Simple church involvement and team member commitment. And look what the Lord does with just a handful of Christians in Corinth. Do you know, I was thinking about Aquila and Priscilla. Think about this. People who have a business, but who make it their business to be absolutely central and supportive of the Lord's business. Interesting, isn't it? People who have a business, there's Aquila and Priscilla, who make it their business to be absolutely central and supportive of the Lord's business. You don't even need to quit your job. Keep it. Keep your job. Use it strategically to enable the gospel ministry in Dublin or France or wherever he's calling you to serve him across the world. Plan your finances accordingly. Plan your every single Sunday streak at church accordingly. Plan your weekdays with this vision to be someone or the couple who enable the preaching of the gospel. The Lord could be speaking to you on that plane just this evening. Now, church planters will tell you this too. There's a crucial role of strategic, gospel-minded teamwork to put lights on in churches across Ireland and across Dublin. That's what it takes. Now, be careful, though. Be really careful. Here's where the cities have distracted us. 
You see, with all their services and leisure and experiences and good things on offer, we've come to think of the church that way, haven't we? Another service provider. A service provider for my Christian life. No. There are teams. Teams that need our commitment for the sake of gospel proclamation, for the sake of new and local churches and old local churches in the months and years to come. And whether you're a teenager or whether you're retired, here's a prayer that you might pray right now. Lord, I have a business. Help me make it my business to be absolutely frontline supportive of your church planting business. That'll engage the city. That'll change lives. That'll add to the numbers of ands in this room when we meet back here 10 years from now. Lord, I have a business. Help me make it my business to be absolutely frontline supportive of your church planting business for the sake of Christ. And then you see it, don't you? It's all the Lord's work. It's all under his sovereign hand. So did you note thirdly that there's a consistent backdrop here of God's sovereignty, particularly in verses 9 to 17. Here's the third thing, the consistent backdrop of God's sovereignty. You see, God's sovereign hand is here all along. That was the reason Aquila and Priscilla were in Corinth in the first place. Verse 2, this expulsion of the Christians from Rome, well, it didn't take the Lord by surprise, did it? And when Paul is feeling the pressure most, when that abuse is mounting and the trouble's brewing, look at verse 9. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. Don't be afraid, Paul. Keep on speaking, for I am with you. No one's going to attack and harm you because I have many people in this city, says the Lord. There's the sovereign hand of the Lord, isn't it? And what did Paul do? He stayed. 18 months teaching the word of God. And the opposition, it came. But as in the episode, look at this episode with Gallio, verses 14 to 17 that we read. As in all those previous examples across Europe, the opposition, you see, it only ever provided one more opportunity for the Lord to grow his people in a slightly different way, in a slightly different place, proclaiming the gospel. Paul stayed on in Corinth, verse 18, and then he moved to Syria, and then Ephesus, and eventually back to his sending church, verse 22. Now, I don't know what this says to you, but it shows me that there will be opposition to any efforts that we make to engage with the city of Dublin. And do you know what? That opposition might be more than the jibes that we sometimes hear in Black Rock. More than the, uh, the preference of some people in our area that we wouldn't use the buildings we use or have preaching in coffee shops. No, there will be opposition. You heard it on the video. There was opposition as Ballycullen was planted and nurtured. There's opposition when Black Rock is planted and nurtured. There'll be opposition when Ashtown is planted and nurtured. There'll be opposition, there'll be setbacks, yet the Lord is powerfully sovereign. His hand cannot be stopped. There's where Luke's bringing us tonight, isn't he? For us, we might need to move next door or down the road, but that's part of engaging the city, you see. But as we prioritize the proclamation anyway, as we commit to building teams for long-term projects, as we face opposition, there comes a deep resilience that rests on the fact that Almighty God is sovereign. He has many people in this city too. People who have, in thousands of cases, I'm, I'm quite sure, yet to hear and respond to the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ and repent and believe in his name and add their testimony to yours and mine. Now, here's one final critical element that we've already seen here in Acts 14, and we're only going to be here for about 10 seconds. Here it is. You may need to move next door because there's a real need for practical flexibility, isn't there? 
a real need for practical flexibility. You might need to move next door. Or in some areas, you might need to move on. But keep speaking. Don't be silent. Don't be afraid. This is the Lord's sovereign work. Um, Use those flex-demanding challenges to keep us preaching and teaching the gospel. Now, here's what not to flex on, and I think that's clear too. Don't flex on the gospel. Don't flex on your commitment. And don't flex on that priority as is laid out here in God's word. I think the Lord is forming a Dublin diaconate. Here's what I mean by that. There's a nucleus of it here in this room. But what that is is team members across this city, in this room, maybe on the live stream, or from where you're listening in. A whole generation, old to young, of committed Dublin team members for what he's about to do. Here's the team for engaging this city and the world. Will you take up your role in it? Preaching, perhaps, or enabling the proclamation work by your business, prepared for even the most vigorous of opposition, and yet committed nonetheless. Let's take a moment to pray. Father, help us to see your work in Corinth and by your word inspire us afresh as we engage with this city too. Father, looking back, we thank you for your hand on the ventures that have gone out from this place in Ballycullen and Black Rock, for your work across this city. And Father, for the next chapter, we ask for your hand on each one of us, prompting us to be the team members that would take up those positions to honor you with our lives and our money and our resources, to be those people who stand by the next church plant for your name's sake. Father, bring those many people in this city. Bring them to faith and repentance and baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Use us. Use us sitting here, sitting at home. Use us for your name's sake. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Unfinished is the task, isn't it? And the song we're about to sing reminds us. Uh, would you stand and sing, Facing a Task Unfinished? Facing a task unfinished that drives us to Jesus. 
Jesus Christ, the Lord. We bear the torch that flaming fell from the hands of Good evening. It's great to be back here uh, in Dublin. Uh, I'm from Dublin originally. Mervyn Scott's my name. I serve as the Director of Baptist Missions in Ireland. And it's been our privilege as a mission to partner with Grosvenor uh, in the planting of Ballycullen and Black Rock. And uh, in fact, this church was I was a member of for many years and was baptised somewhere over there, I think where the old baptistry used to be uh, back in 1985, probably before a lot of you were even born. So I feel very old uh, this evening. But I've got some young people here with me, uh, Cormac and Anya Walsh. Maybe Cormac and Anya, introduce yourself, please, to us. Tell us a little bit about yourselves, how you met, you know, a little bit of romantic vibe, please, if you will, and uh, a little bit about your family as well, please. Um, so my name's Cormac. Um, I'm from Kerry originally. I uh, came to Dublin to, to study um, in Trinity. Um, when I, I lived in my first year in Rathmines, tried to find Grosvenor, wandered around for an hour, got lost, so that's why I didn't end up here. Um, and uh, met Anya in Trinity, College Christian Union, and um, we were part of Emmanuel uh, Church at the time, and um, we were in Mayo for a few years, helping plant the church there, and back for the last six years in North Dublin, we are part of the Jamestown Road Baptist Church. Um. Yeah. Um, I'm Anya, married to Cormac, and um, we have three little kids. Uh, I think they might appear up here. Oh, there they are, look yeah. at that. Um, I'm very sleep deprived in that photo. Um, yeah, Senin is the baby, um, he's nine months, and Tomas and Kara are four and a half and nearly three. Um, yeah, and actually when I first became a Christian, um, I came to Grosvenor, and it's funny, um, Ed and I hadn't seen each other in ages, but Ed interviewed me up here years ago and sent me over to the north side to be part of a local church, so great things have happened here. There you go. Ed, I've been listening to Richard's sermon then and sending people out to help at church planting teams. Great. Um, and to about Ashtown, where you're living, and, and why do you want to plant a church, or why do you want to see uh, God plant a church 
in the area of Ashton? Well, if you go all the way back to when we were first going out, I used to cycle through through Fibsborough in, in Dublin, um, and so Anya lives in that area pretty much, and I was just shocked. There's this big chunk of Dublin that doesn't have churches, and that's the case in, in most of, of the north side especially. Um, and so we, we moved back to Dublin about six-ish years ago, um, and we've been working, I'm working as a civil engineer, and um, we're living in this area, um, and just become more and more aware over time just how unreached it is, just how, like, no, people just aren't hearing the gospel, um, pretty much. If you're from there, you're not hearing the gospel. So that conviction that its local churches are God's way of reaching areas, but also the most effective way, um, was just something that, that we wanted to, to start a, a church there. So we joined Jamestown Road Baptist Church. We were part of them for years, um, building up the relationship, and they sent us out probably... Um, I think it was January of 2019, we started meeting uh, like every second week at first and then with the pandemic we've been meeting every week on Zoom and under trees and parks and in all kinds of places for um, a couple of years now. Um, so Ashdown, is there a picture? There's Ashdown. So basically Ashdown is the, the furthest out and then you've got Cabra and Fibsra. So it's, it's basically along the Royal Canal. So if you are just north of the Phoenix Park, there's a whole, a whole slice of the, the city and it's about 50,000 people who aren't here in the gospel. And for me that's that's just a, a need and you know you've, the gospel is the answer and it's I suppose our conviction is that a local church doesn't have to be amazing we don't have to be the best at anything we just have to be present be a local church actually you know preach the bible love each other talk to our neighbors about the gospel those basic everyday things that churches do the strategy is just doing it in a place where no one else is doing it um so that's basically what we're doing so um, I've been working as an engineer. I haven't had that much time to uh, devote. I, it was um, appreciated what Richard was putting that, that uh, emphasis on proclamation, the centrality of it. Um, so in the next few weeks, on the 1st of March, I'm going to start working with Baptist Missions full time just to have that, that space and energy and time to devote to that. Um, and we have a, a team who've gathered around us. Um, I think there's a picture um, of us there, hopefully. Uh, that's us. Lots of babies. Um, uh, lots of people running around screaming, mainly babies. Um, so um, we gather in the local community centre in Ashtown, um, and we mainly people from the area. A few people have moved to be part of, of the church. You know, people who've moved back from England and deliberately chose to buy a house in our area. Or um, some of you know Mary Teresa, who's part of this church, has moved over to the north side to be part of, of our church plant, and um, that's needed. You know, it's not, it's not much good if it's just us in a room. You need, you need normal Christians doing normal Christian things, but in a strategic location. So um, your Priscilla's and Aquilas are arriving. Yeah, no, it's, it's okay. and look, right. we're, we're amazed. Like, it just really is. We're, okay. We'll feel very, very blessed that other people get it. Um, and now, Anya, church planting, it's not for the faint-hearted. It's not a walk in the park. It's not a kind of leisure pursuit. Um, so how can we be praying for you and Cormac and those involved already uh, in the days ahead in terms of the work in Ashdown. Yeah, thank you. Um, pray that God will continue to establish us and develop us as a church. We have um, a committed group of kind of 12 adults and then a heap of children um, and that we would, yeah, that we'd really keep growing as a church family as we move towards being a church, you know, on that journey from church plant, that we'd be loving one another and um, pray for our relationships with other people and um, that we all have friends and neighbors, that we have really good trust built up relationships and that we'd be taking the opportunities that we have to share the gospel and the people who become Christians. And just that big transition um, for Cormac with Baptist Missions, just for us as a family as well. Um, we're really excited about it and there's a lot of opportunity that's going to come with it but it's a big change from full-time work in engineering to full-time ministry so yeah great and i do hope you will take Cormac and Anya upon your hearts and your prayers our, our motto in baptist mission is proclaiming christ and planting churches and you'll find that on our pens and there's a whole heap of them up here in the table and as ryan tuberty would say there's one for everybody in the audience okay so don't leave this evening without a free baptist missions pen and a free baptist missions bookmark but what about you tonight? We've been challenged from God's word to be involved and be part of these church planting teams. How will you involve yourself in helping to see churches being planted in Dublin?
So, how can you be involved? Would you partner with us in the work in Dublin? Partner with us in prayer. Partnering in prayer for mission begins with an awareness of need and follows through with the commitment to pray along with others that God would meet those needs in a way that only he can do. Partner with us in proclaiming. We need people to proclaim Christ with us and to plant churches with us. Maybe you're planning on moving to Dublin to work or to study and you're wondering where to live. Why not think about what church to be involved with, where you can partner in this? Or maybe you're already in Dublin. Have you thought that you could be God's answer to the question, who is going to help plant the next church? Partner with us in providing. We need your partnership in providing resources for this gospel proclaiming church planting mission. And if you've been giving regularly over the past number of years, thank you for playing your part, for your ongoing commitment uh, that has put work like ours in Black Rock um, into motion here to the glory of God. The simple reality is that without you taking just a minute or two to set up a monthly gift to Baptist missions, the vital work of our mission can't be sustained or developed. But the brilliance of partnership is that we can provide the resources for this Christ-proclaiming work together, every single one of us. God's heart is to see many more people in Dublin knowing Christ, following Him as their Lord and Saviour. Dublin is a city where Christ needs to be proclaimed and churches need to be planted. Will you partner with us? More planters being put on the ground here in Dublin in the future on that table there to my left, your right. Um, and I think there's room in Dublin for at least 10 or 20, 30, maybe 50 more church planting teams on the ground here in this city. Who knows what God will do but he can do it with your help and involvement in those different areas. Dublin is a needy city, as we've heard tonight, but the gospel needs to be proclaimed not just in Dublin, not just in Ireland, but across the world to all nations, as Ed reminded us at the beginning of our time together this evening. And a young family from Brannockstown in County Kildare last July left these shores to go and tell people in the land of France about Jesus. They arrived actually on Bastille Day to fireworks and music and celebration. But we're going to get a little insight into how they've been getting on and how you can be praying for them as they seek to make Christ known in the land of France. So we've heard a lot this evening about the great needs there are for gospel work in Dublin. Uh, but we know that God's work is not limited to Ireland. I have here with me David and Hannah Sandal, uh, originally from Brannockstown Baptist Church in County Kildare, uh, but recently they were sent by their church family here in Ireland to work as Baptist missions workers in Eglaton in southwest of France. So David and Hannah, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Thank you. Um, Hannah, maybe you can tell us a bit about your family and also what you've been up to in France since July um, last year. Uh, yeah, tell us um, how you and the girls are settling into life there. Yeah, so uh, we have three girls, Eva, Emma and Abby. Um, they are just about to be 12 and 10 and 8. Um, and yes, yeah, so we moved in July. Um, and really the main thing we've been doing since moving is just getting ourselves settled in, um, getting to know the area a bit. Um, our main job at the moment is learning French, uh, which is hard work, but we're, we're getting there slowly. Um, and the girls then have been going to school and getting settled into a new school. So they go to a French speaking school. Um, and that's obviously tough and tricky for them um, and they found that really quite hard last term but they're getting settled more this term um, and are enjoying enjoying going or at least going a bit more happily every morning uh, which is great so so yeah we've really just been getting to know people in, in the local town um, and getting to know the area as well that's great 
And David, can you share a little um, with us about what the gospel needs are in France um, and what opportunities are there for proclaiming Christ in France at the moment? Well, uh, France is a country of about 65 million people. Uh, in the 1970s, I think there was about, uh, about 50,000 evangelical Christians. And now they say there's about 650,000 evangelical Christians. So the church has been growing in France and we are very thankful about that. Uh, however, uh, like many countries, the rural areas are uh, maybe bereft of evangelical churches. So we're out in the middle of a, a really rural area uh, of, of, of France. Uh, there's probably some of the, uh, the least reached uh, uh, one of the least reached areas of France, um, very nationalistic, uh, very um, liberal uh, church has maybe for about two generations, uh, church has, has, has not really been part of people's lives. Uh, so it's challenging. However, we're finding that people are open to speak about God and they are interested in why we're here. We've had uh, some really good opportunities to speak to the local Keresian people. Uh, about our faith uh, and about what Jesus has done in our lives and what Jesus can do in their lives. We're also fortunate here in Eglinton that there's a university here and uh, there's about 2,000 students uh, in, in Eglinton. So we've been really blessed. We've been able to, to reach out to some students, particularly from Muslim countries. We had a, a youth, just a, a student event before Christmas. About 39 students were present and about 30 of those were Muslim. Uh, and uh, it was great to be able to introduce Christmas, uh, talk about the birth of Jesus Christ, uh, and then to, uh, we had a meal, so to say grace uh, uh, before that meal. So that was really, really nice. So there is lots of opportunities to reach out to people. Uh, the, we're finding people are receptive, uh, certainly uh, at, the, at the beginning anyway, to hear about what we're doing here and to hear about Jesus. But uh, I think we're prepared that it's a long and slow process to build up relationships, to be able to see uh, fruit of the, of the gospel in people's lives here in rural Kares. Great, that's so encouraging to hear how you've already had opportunities. I mean, you're just learning the language, but still having opportunities to share about Jesus with people and the impact he's had on your lives. Um, so yeah, that's really encouraging. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear finally from you both, um, how can we be praying for you and the kids in these early months in France? Um, yeah, well, in terms of the kids, I think just that they would continue to uh, progress in their own French, um, that they'd settle into school well, they still obviously find that quite hard. Um, so just that they'd make really good friends and that they'd, they'd just, yeah, really get a good understanding of French. Um, and then I suppose for us, um, for me, just to, to, to meet people, I find it quite hard to meet the, the women sort of in, are in, in the school and things like that. So just that maybe I would get opportunities to really get into that and, and break into being able to, to chat to the women in the local area. That would be my one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me, learning the language is very difficult. I struggle, um, but, I, uh, but we're progressing all the time. And so I need lots of prayer. Uh, about that and um, we've found it difficult to find uh, good French uh, tutoring so uh, just that that in this uh, in 2022 will become uh, maybe more consistent and uh, be more valuable to us. Uh, if we just look at a couple of uh, people that I've been reaching out to we have a girl Sharia who's a, a, a girl from Iran a Muslim girl who we were able to give a Bible to in Farsi. Uh, so it was the first time she had a Bible in her hands and a first time, of course, to have a Bible in the Farsi language mm -hmm. in her hands. And it was amazing to see her uh, take a Bible uh, home. And she's been to church with us a couple of times. Uh, uh, also for a young student called Blas from Rwanda, who certainly, uh, if he hasn't made a commitment, he is very close to making a commitment uh, to following the Lord Jesus Christ mm -hmm. as his king. Uh, and uh, another guy, a 51-year-old man, uh, Pierre, who we meet quite a bit, and he's very interested to hear uh, about Jesus. Uh, he's been through uh, quite a lot of trials in his life, and uh, we're really um, enjoying just getting to know him and being able to share the good news with him. 
Um, so yeah, I really do uh, uh, covet your prayers for our family here in, in France. It's not uh, simple to leave uh, the uh, comforts of home, the comforts of language, uh, the comforts of our family and our church family and the, the people that are close to us and to come out into um, this rural area. But we have been really blessed by God and uh, we are, uh, are really enjoying um, the, the, the aspects of mission uh, of, of just being out here and being able to tell people about Jesus. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that to us is a real joy. So we thank you for your prayers, please. Uh, if you don't pray for us, pray for us. <laughs> and if you do, continue to pray for us as we, uh, as we uh, reach out uh, to, uh, with the gospel here in France. Great, thank you guys so much for sharing with us um, a bit of your story um, and for those prayer points. We will be praying for you guys a little bit later in the service this evening. Uh, but yeah, thank you again so much for joining us uh, tonight. And uh, yeah, all the best as you uh, settle into life in France. Thank, thank you. you. Thanks for having us. God bless. God uh, at work in Corinth. And who but God could take a girl from Iran a farmer and his wife from Brannockstown and caused their past to cross in a town in France that I admit I never heard of until a couple of years ago and probably most of you never heard of until this evening. If you'd like to pray for the Sandal family, David and Hannah, the three girls, Eva, Emma and Abby, there's some cards there on the table. I'll give you a little uh, aid to pray. Maybe stick it on your fridge or put it in your Bible. You can be praying for them as a family. You know, loneliness is a real issue, particularly for Hannah. So if your lady's here this evening, Will you pray for Hannah that God might just bring a friend her way, just one friend, her own gender, who she could have in Eglaton, France. We're going to stand and sing again, and the band are going to lead us. Jesus shall reign where'er the song. Let's stand and sing together. Jesus shall reign where the sun does its successive journeys run. His kingdom stretch from shore to shore till sun shall rise and sit no Scenes abound where he reigns. The prisoner leaves to build his head. His name will fade and you shall rise. In every morning sacrifice. praise rising through eternal days just and faithful he shall reign Jesus shall reign people and realms of Do 
We're going to pray, and there's going to be a cup of tea afterwards. Uh, just a word of thanks to Grover for hosting this event this evening, for our musicians, to Sarah at the back who's been doing the PowerPoint, for Kim, whose idea this night was of putting it all together, uh, and for everybody who took part this evening, particularly Richard for bringing God's word to us. We want to thank you all. But as Ed said at the beginning of our program this evening, maybe you're here this evening and you don't know the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Maybe you're sitting here thinking, what is all this stuff about telling people about Jesus? Well, you know, would thrill any of us here this evening who've been involved at front uh, or anybody uh, who you know, who maybe you've come with, who is a Christian, just to share with you a little bit more what it means to be a follower of the Lord Jesus and what he means to us. And if we can maybe pass on a book or a, I'm offering on Grover's behalf a free Bible or a gospel, wherever it might be, we'd love to do that, to tell you more about him. Because ultimately, it's not about us. It's not even about planting churches. It's ultimately about seeing the name and person of the Lord Jesus being known and honored and worshiped. Let's pray for a moment together. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We worship you this evening as the risen Savior, as the reigning Savior, as the one who will come back, as the returning King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Father, we ask as we leave with the challenge of your word to our hearts this evening, how we can be involved in seeking to see this city and this nation and this world being reached with the good news of your gospel, of your son. Lord, would you equip us? Would you empower us by your spirit even tomorrow morning back in college, in university, in our workplace, in our families, in our homes, in our streets, wherever you've placed us? Lord, may we make it our business to proclaim the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Thank you for your presence with us this evening. Be with us in our time of fellowship around a cup of tea now. And Lord, we pray that in time to come, when we come back, maybe as Richard said in your goodness, in 10 years' time, may we hear stories, more stories like Anne's, more Anne's, more people across this city and across this land and across this world who have come to know our Savior too. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you.